Live from the Mecca of Mormonism, Salt Lake City, Utah. This is Heart of the Matter, where Mormonism meets biblical Christianity face to face. I'm your host, Sean McCraney, standing here with a wonderful group from all over the world, literally. Actually, the main part of this group is from Escondido, California. They're from Emmanuel Faith Community Church. We have Steve here, who's their spokesperson. He's just going to tell us quickly about what they have been up to. We have been visiting the Temple Square, the Conference Center, and those, those areas, and have gotten in great conversations. And we have been able to actually get them to say their testimony, which means they, they're, they're giving up because we've had greater evidence than they do. Ah. And so it's been, a, it's been a, an exciting adventure, and a lot of us have grown in how we share our faith. Excellent. Praise God. Is there anything your group would like to say? One, two, three. Faith, faith is, is the blind. blind. They said faith is not blind. And what does that mean? Why, why would you say that, Steve? Well, that's because every time we cornered an LDS missionary, they said, well, you have to believe it by faith time and time again. And that's the way they got out of every time they yeah. couldn't give us an answer. I got it. And so, and what is the Christian response to that? Faith is supported by evidence. Ah, beautiful. We love that. Thank you very much for being on the show. Bubby! Hello. Step forward. We have Bobby Gilpin, an old friend all the way from where? In I'm from Middlesbrough in the northeast of England, just below Newcastle. People tend to know where that is. Just below Newcastle. Okay. People tend to know where that is. Or not. Uh, Bobby, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. um, I've been back in, this is my third year running, coming to Utah. Um, each time I've been working with Russ East from Utah Partnerships for Christ. I've been here with a group from Bethel Grace, Baptist in California. We've been down to Manti doing outreach on the streets. We've been Temple Square. We've been various different parts, just Salt Lake City, just speaking to LDS guys, just trying to get good discussions. Have you learned anything new on this trip? Have I learned anything new? Um, I think I've realized quite often when I'm speaking to LDS people on a personal level, it's easy just to pick at you know, negatives, you know, things like that. But I was really challenged at Manti that when we speak to these guys, just focus on Jesus. Look at who he is, look at what he really said about himself, look at what he really said on issues such as pre-existence or whatever. And that alone is often enough to kind of get through to LDS guys, the kind of key differences. Because the LDS church today, as we obviously all know, claims to be Christian, the name of Jesus in our church, all that kind of thing. So actually just showing them that there is a difference there between that Jesus and this Jesus, I think Excellent. is really powerful. I wish I could talk like you. Well, can you give me lessons? I'm sure you can. Very oh, expensive excellent. though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I bet. <laughs> Thanks excellent. for being on, Bobby. Thanks for having me. Really good Thank to you. see you. Hey, listen, uh, church, you want to find one? Well, if you can't find one you're comfortable with, check us out at www.campus.com. We meet on Sundays at the U of U, 10 a.m., 2.30 p.m. Uh, go to campuswithhyphens.com for more information. Also on Sundays from 1 to 2 p.m., uh, AM 820, The Truth, my favorite radio station in Utah, replays Heart of the Matter every Sunday from 1 to 2 p.m., so check them out. Friday nights at 8 p.m. right here on TV20. Uh, you can also tune in to Bishop Earl, who interviews people who were once LDS and are now born again Christians. The name of the show, The X-Files. If you want to be interviewed, email Bishop Earl at Mormon X-Files, X-Mormon Files, dot tv whatever it is it will be on the screen i'm sorry for butchering that uh it's the first of the month and time for us to promote the transitions program what is it it's a program available to all churches around the u.s that helps train christian leadership it's very much needed now uh and their congregates to receive and disciple people who are coming out of mormonism and into the body here's a list of transitions trained churches in the state of utah Ah, beautiful. And Adventure, Calvary Chapel, Clearfield, Alpine, Calvary Chapel, Salt Lake, Alpine and West Haven, First Presbyterian, Salt Lake, Cash Valley Bible Church, Good Shepherd Lutheran, Holy Cross Lutheran, K2 The Church, Legacy Fellowship, Main Street Church, Mount Olympus Presbyterian, Mountain Life Evangelical Free Church, New Pilgrim Baptist, Provo Baptist Church, South Mountain Community Church, the Church at Water's Edge, and that is it. Listen, we, re we read those churches off so that if you're LDS and you've come out and you're out in those areas where those churches were named and you say, hey, I want to go to a place that understands what I've been through, those people have been trained on the transitions program. If you didn't see your church there, say to your pastor, hey, you know, transitions training is free. Uh, why not bring it into our church so we can be prepared? 
All right, get your calendars out. Our seventh annual Burning Heart event will be on Saturday, September 1st at Murray Park Amphitheater beginning at 3 p.m. This year we're going to try to do some new things, so set that date aside. In the coming week we'll explain what some of those new things are. Uh, but they're going to include uh, a, a kind of a statewide communion time uh, along with some worship. And then we're going to go to the open water baptisms in the evening. Lots of great products available, food, ministries, booths, booths, booths all that stuff uh, available uh, at our Burning Heart event. We do it every year, Saturday, September 1st, 2012, Murray Park Amphitheater, 3 to 9 p.m. We kicked off our summer tour last week as I visited Alabama, the first independent Methodist church in Decatur. Now, I ain't been to the South before, except Florida, and uh, I gotta tell you, those people are friendly, they're kind, they're polite, and the best folk I ever met. And I'm not kidding, Southern hospitality is alive and well in Alabama. We had a great time together over at the First Methodist Church, three different nights, three different groups, and uh, we wanna thank uh, Jamie and Cindy uh, Cummins for their hard work in setting this up. Pastor Hal, a one of a kind. Uh, the turnout was great. In fact, we had supporters from Tennessee, from Florida, from Georgia travel as far as 10 hours away, one way to come to these events. And so we just praise God for them. Next stop, Calvary Chapel, Norman, Oklahoma. If you live in that area, please join us. We'll tell you when in the next uh, week or so. It seems like there was a public mass exodus held in Utah this past week. What were the people exiting from? Mormonism. This was a highly significant, very symbolic event, and let me tell you why. Mormonism thrives in the shadows of reality. Thank you, Tanners, for that title. When an individual chooses to leave the Mormon church, the local leaders very rarely will make an announcement or tell everybody. A few key people know. They downplay it. And then they always assign the fault of the person leaving to the person, not to the church, not to anything else, but to the person. This is the model they've used for years. In fact, people who come out of Mormon are, Mormonism are often stunned that so few people call them or come by and say, where have you been? I, I heard you left. Or when they see them months later, they'll still think they're coming to church. When they have left, they've taken their names off. And, and, and the reason for this is that people don't know they've left. That's how they do it. They just let people go off, crawl under a bush and die, and they act like they were never there before. And it's a way of controlling the group. So it's significant and very symbolic that this event included 120 uh, once LDS people who stood together publicly and made uh, an exodus together. A sign of things to come, I hope. It would be wonderful if the organizer of that uh, did a public exodus and uh, held this event quarterly or monthly or whatever it would be. And listen, while I'm wholly supportive of people coming out uh, of this and the significance of it and the group, um, it is a cause of concern. And let me tell you why. A few weeks ago, I was at a shopping center and there was a man standing there who was very uh, uh, deep in thought. And he was standing outside a pet store. And then he entered the pet store and he uh, came back out with a box in his hands. And he stepped out from under the facade of the pet store and he opened up the box and he lifted it to the sky. And nothing happened, so he shook the box a little and this yellow canary came and came right on the edge of the box. And he shook it again and the canary took off did a U-turn and flew right back into the pet store window, boom, knocked it down, laying there on the asphalt, it didn't kill it, so the guy rushes over, he picks it up, it was stunned, and then he holds it back up to the sky and he shakes it a little bit, tries to get it to go, and it flies to the closest tree. Now, uh, I, after the guy tossed the box, I'm sure he walked away thinking he had done some, a great deed in releasing that bird from its cage, but, uh, the chances of that bird surviving out there in the wilderness without any support is slim to none. And herein lies my concern with the Ensign Peak event. Uh, I applaud this people's courage and their willingness to publicly exit the cage of Mormonism. And, um, but will they have the ability to establish a real relationship with God uh, after they have been so burned by this religion and them telling them that this is the absolute truth. The chances are slim. So remember, God did not have 
uh, Moses lead the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage only to abandon them once they escaped and leave them standing there in the wilderness. So while it's good for people to walk away from the trappings of any false religion, it's just as important for them to know how to come to a relationship with the true and living God, preferably all the while they're learning about the truth of their, of their church. You know, it's one thing to extract a bird from a cage. It's another thing just to let it go. I mean, I'm hoping that people will not let go of who Christ is because Jesus is taught, a Jesus is taught in Mormonism, but that, that we can as a community help them understand who he is so that they don't just leave and go to the bars and to the streets and to all the other things that the world has to offer. And with that, how about a moment from the word? Tonight we're in John chapter 9, verses 1 through 2, where it reads, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did this sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? LDS apostles and missionaries will sometimes use these passages to prove their idea that this man existed in a pre-existent state before coming to this earth and getting a body. And they'll ask, well, why would the Jews ask Jesus who sinned, this man or his parents? Where could a man who was born blind sin, but in only in a pre-existent state, you see? And it's a classic example of reading the Bible, trying to find passages that support your views, rather than le reading the Bible and learning from it what it me means and what the context is, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We know from other passages of Scripture that the only human being to ever walk on the face of this earth that had a pre-existent life was Jesus Christ. He himself said, I am from above, you, talking to humans, you are from beneath. Uh, so what of this question that the Jews asked? First of all, we have to remember that by the time the Lord was walking on the earth, the Jewish uh, truth had been really lost and twisted and turned around, and there was a lot of myths and fables involved. A lot of the stuff that came down from Sinai to them had become corrupted by the Jewish traditions and, and fables, etc. When Alexander the Great came in, representing Greece, and, and he took over, uh, Hellenistic influence upon the Jews greatly infiltrated their culture. Then the Romans came in, who adopted much of Hellenistic culture, and they too reinforced these myths and fables. So by the time Jesus was teaching here, uh, they were asking all kinds of errant questions, and Jesus was correcting them as they went. According to the Bible scholar Lightfoot, he says that the Jews at this time believed in something called the transmigration of souls, which is that if a person became so sinful, their soul could transmigrate to another person. And uh, whether it's at death, and you know the Scientologists believe the same thing. Scientologists believe that you need to become clear in your conscience and all your sin and everything, so when you die, you will be able to wisely choose another body to enter instead of badly choosing because of fear and all kinds of sin and stuff. So they say, Scientologists say, if you die with a bad conscience and all kinds of things on your conscience, you might choose to go into a dog, you know? Uh, but if you're clear, which you get clear by going through their processes, you will then go into the king of England and, you know, and you'll make a really wise choice. So that's what they teach. Well, the transmigration of souls idea was kind of the same thing. The Hellenistic idea of uh, a pre-existent life also existed. Uh, the Greeks had long taught that men and women came from a place before this. And Joseph Smith merely borrowed from them when he taught a preexistence. And then the Jews also maintained uh, the idea that an infant could actually sin in the mother's womb. So those are three ways that the Jews could have misinterpreted why this man was born blind. Of course, Jesus comes along and he clears up the misconception. In verse 3, he says, Neither has this man sinned nor his parents. He says, But... He was born blind that, he, that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Meaning, I'm going to heal him. He was born blind so that this event would occur and, and, and the glory of God would be achieved. So, uh, interesting stuff when you read the scripture and you read it in context rather than just reading to uh, find something that supports your errant positions. And with that, let's have a word of prayer. 
Father God, we thank you for life and your ministry. We're grateful to be a part of it. We pray for those uh, who are out there searching for truth. We pray for our staff, our volunteers, people who are working so hard to keep this show going uh, behind the scenes, in front of the scenes. We pray for the people who are victims of these fires and that you will, Lord, have mercy on our land and just quell them and help us to uh, get back to normal and that these people whose property and lives are in danger will be protected, Lord. We pray for them collectively in Jesus' name, amen. All right, last week we presented some troubling changes in the most corrected book on the face of the earth, uh, the Book of Mormon. Tonight, let's examine some problems the Book of Mormon narrative contains. We talked, we showed you last week things that were changed, literally corrected in this book that supposedly came from God's mouth to Joseph's eyes to Oliver Cowdery's hand. But let's first look at what Steve Conley has called some slips of the tongue in the Book of Mormon. Now Conley suggests that instead of seeing the actual words on a piece of parchment appear before his eyes in a hat, that Smith was narrating and coming up with the stuff as he went along, probably from an outline, and that when he made a mistake in his narrative, he would fix it, and it would be recorded in the narrative. So let's give you some examples. Mosiah 7, 8 reads, They were again brought before the king and were permitted, or rather commanded, that they should answer the questions. So if it was a direct revelation from God, why would God say that they were permitted, oh, I mean, or rather permitted, they were commanded, uh, you know, why would he make that change midstream like Joseph did? Another example of this is in Alma 5.10. Listen to this. Alma says, I have never known much of the ways of the Lord and his mysteries and marvelous power. I said I had never known much of these things, but behold, I mistake, for I have seen much of his mysteries and marvelous power. So he totally changes his mind in the very thing he was saying. That wouldn't happen if it was a translation from a hard copy of gold or if it was Joseph Smith actually reading words from God and giving them to Oliver. It happened because he had an outline and he was making up the story as he went and he corrected himself right then and there. Alma 24, 19 says, And thus we see that they buried their weapons of peace, or they buried their weapons of war of peace, for peace. Uh, so again, we have a correction right there in the text of this great Book of Mormon. Uh, in Alma 43:38, Joseph Smith dictated this, which Oliver Cowdery recorded. They being shielded from the more vital parts of the body, or the more vital parts of the body being shielded from the strokes of the Lamanites. So this was totally coming out of Joseph Smith's head, and it's proven by these discombobulated sentences where he's kind of doing a stream of consciousness and he's saying, and therefore I stepped into the stream or rather I stepped onto the bridge that was covering the stream because he was giving it to him. He was doing it, none of the other things. In 2 Nephi uh, 15, 5.15 of the most corrected book on the face of the earth, it reads, and I did teach my people to build buildings and to work in all manner of wood and of iron and of copper and of brass, and of steel, and of gold, and of silver, and of precious ores, which were in great abundance. Then in the next verse, he says, And I, Nephi, did build a temple, and I did construct it after the manner of uh, Temple of Solomon, save it were not built of so many precious things, for they were not to be found upon the land. I mean, in the, earth, the verse right before it, he says, there's gold and silver and precious ores which were in great abundance. And then the next verse he says, none of it's found upon the land to build the, 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 the temple out of. All right? The Book of Mormon says that the people of Zarahemla, they rejoiced when Mosiah said, hey, I have these brass plates and they have your genealogy on them. And, and the Book of Mormon says the people of Zarahemla rejoiced. But in the Book of Omni, 117, it says that Messiah could not understand the people of Zarahemla because their language had all become corrupted. And so how could they ever understand that their genealogy was on the brass plates and rejoice over it if they couldn't understand each other? Uh, we have clumsy writing found throughout the Book of Mormon. Let me give you one example. We'll get to the others as we come across them. For example, 2 Nephi 4.14 actually reads, For a more history part are written upon mine other plates. For a more history part are written upon mine other... Uh, huh? 
a, a more history part? Um, okay. Of course, we've pointed out the anachronistic use of Jesus in the uh, Book of Mormon, uh, but all through it, it says, and his name shall be Jesus Christ. 600 years before uh, Jesus is uh, born, it says in the Book of Mormon, his name shall be Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, 600 years before Jesus was born, Greek wasn't even in existence. The name Christ is Greek. It, it, in the Book of Mormon, it would be like it's saying, and his name shall be Jesus Messiah. Jesus didn't have a last name. His last name wasn't Christ. They act like it was Jesus Samuelson or something. It, Jesus Christ is his title. And it wouldn't have been Christ because the Greek language didn't exist 600 years before his birth. And so it would be Jesus Messiah, and that's still just a title. So another great mistake. The Book of Mormon also says that Jesus would be born at Jerusalem which is the land of our forefathers. The phrase at Jerusalem is used all through the Book of Mormon, and it's speaking of Jerusalem specifically. Where was Jesus born? He was born in Bethlehem. So important is this that in the Old Testament, Micah prophesies that the Messiah will come from Bethlehem. It's a very specific place. Is it Jerusalem? No. Is it, is it right next to Jerusalem, like Salt Lake City's right next to Murray? No, not right next to. And so it's a specific place, and it was so specific, God wanted it to be specific because that's where the Messiah would come from. Yet the Book of Mormon says he would be born at Jerusalem. Uh, the Book of Mormon claims that Nephi and his family left for Jerusalem to sail to the New World in the first year of the reign of of Zedekiah, uh, the king of Judah. Now listen, this is a real zinger. The Book of Mormon says in the first reigning year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, Lehi and his family left to go to the, toward the promised land. But if Nephi and his family left in the first year of the reign of Zedekiah, how would Nephi later in the Book of Mormon be able to report that Jeremiah was cast into prison? Why do we ask? Because Jeremiah being cast into prison didn't happen until the 10th year of the reign of Zedekiah. So they left in the first year of the reign of Zedekiah and they traveled through the wilderness and they built boats and they took off. And then 10 years later, after they had left, uh, scripture reports that uh, Jeremiah was thrown in, in prison. How would that be recorded in the Book of Mormon? They would have had no, no knowledge of this. They left the place. Uh, and then there's a, the Book of Mormon, Mormonians disguise problem. And this isn't that big of a deal. You can read it a lot of different ways. But there is a prophet named Abinadi in the Book of Mormon. And he ticks off a king named Noah because he's preaching repentance to the people. And, and Noah wants to kill Abinadi. So Abinadi takes off and hides for uh, two years. And then he comes back. And this is what Messiah 12.1 says. And it came to pass that after a space of two years that Abinadi came among them in disguise, that they knew him not, and began to prophesy among them, saying, Thus has the Lord commanded me, saying, Abinadi, go and prophesy unto this people. So this is what it's saying. The guy, was they wanted to kill him. He put on a disguise. He went back, and when he preached to him, he said, The Lord told me to come before you and say, Abinadi. What's that? What's the disguise for? Then there is a point we have already mentioned, and that the Book of Mormon is that it's, uh, they were Jews, and they were supposed to keep the law of Moses. Second Nephi 5.10 says, And we did observe to keep the judgments and statutes and the commandments of the Lord in all things according to the law of Moses. Nowhere. In Joseph Smith's Book of Mormonian, does it anywhere mention Passover feasts, observance or celebrations, sabbatical feasts, jubilees, purification rituals, other feasts, or circumcision? It's nowhere in this Jewish text. And yet that one passage says we did keep it all. Now listen carefully. Some Mormons try to defend and say that Messiah 2.4 clearly shows that the, they did observe the law of Moses. This is what it says in Messiah. It says... In the Book of Mormon, they also took the firstlings of their flock that they might offer sacrifices and burnt offerings according to the law of Moses. That singular passage is what Mormons used to say, see, they did. But here's the problem. 
Under the law of Moses, the firstling of every flock was considered as already belonging to God and therefore could only be used as a peace offering, never a burnt offering. And so what Joseph, not knowing these intricacies, he just threw in and when they used him as a burnt, a Jew would never do that because the law would not permit it. So we can see that these errors are huge. A Jew would never do it. Um, major faux pas, Senor Smith, major for Jewish people. Another embarrassing mistake in the Book of Mormon was the Nephite people were supposedly so impressed with Nephi the, Nephi the king, they made a decree that all kings thereafter would be called Nephi. Jacob 1.1 tells us about it. Wherefore the people were desirous to retain in remembrance his name. And whoso should reign in his steed were called by the people second Nephi, third Nephi, and so forth, according to the reigns of the kings, and thus they were called by the people. But the very next king was named Messiah. And no kings thereafter in the Book of Mormon are ever named Nephi. Um, and then we have the brother of Jared mistake. We're getting to it. Uh, Ether 3.15 uh, God says to the brother of Jared, and remember Joseph Smith is writing a, 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 a parallel to the Bible, never have I showed myself unto man whom I've created. That's a quote. Yet in the Doctrine and Covenants, 107.54, Joseph Smith the, says the Lord appeared to uh, Adam, showed himself to Adam. So we have a complete contradiction there. And we also have Joseph Smith saying he, uh, uh, the Lord appeared to him. Uh, Joseph made another boo-boo on that one. Uh, and then we have the word adieu. That is a French word. Adieu makes itself into the text of the Book of Mormon. Uh, now, Mormon defenders say, well, as a translator, Joseph had the liberty to use whatever word would fit what he was translating. And I would agree. If he was translating from a set of gold plates and was just looking at them and he knew how to do it and he saw a word that was tough and mm, I think I'm going to have to use French here to say goodbye and, and put it in, that would make sense. But if he's reading off, off writing coming from God in a hat that's telling him what to say and Oliver's recording it, it means God chose to use adieu. God is telling him to use the word adieu. I, I tell you, uh, I suppose it's possible. It, it, maybe God was a beret. Uh, I mean, where does it end? And, and so finally, let's look at the biggest farce in the world in terms of mistakes in the Book of Mormonian. And that it, it makes you wonder how anybody, how any woman running for president of the United States and is going to govern our country could believe this stuff. Uh, what am I talking about? The Jaredite barges. In the Book of Ether and the Book of Mormon, uh, it claims that God confounded the language at the Tower of Babel. By the way, I looked it up. It's Babel. Babel. And at that time, there at the Tower of Babel, God told Jared and his brother, flee and go. And so they did. And the brother of Jared, Joseph later tells us, his name was Mahanrai Mori Ankomer. Uh, anyway, God told Mahanrai Mori Ankomer to build eight barges. And this is how the Book of Mormonian describes these barges, which are going to cross over the Pacific Ocean from the Tower of Babel's area and land in the Americas, it says. And they were small, and they were light upon the water, even unto the likeness of a fowl upon the water. They were exceedingly tight, even that they would hold water like unto a dish. And the ends were peaked, and the length was the length of a tree. So what we have is a tree-length, football-shaped thing. That's really about, and I've seen pictures drawn by Mormon people who say it was all like a football-shaped thing, it was covered in animal skins. The Mahan Rai Mori Ankimer made eight of them. All right? Now, you got that glorious per, uh, description? The Book of Mormon says a furious wind, in Ether 6.5, then blew. And for 344 days it blew, and these barges landed in the Americas. If that wind pushed those barges just three knots, that would mean the, about the speed you could walk. They would get to the Americas 
far sooner. And in fact, they would circle the globe with a furious wind pushing that strong. Uh, uh, and they were light and they were floating upon the water. But what makes the story even more ridiculous is that these barges acted like submarines. Animal skinned, they would go beneath the ocean during storms, still cruising along. And then it gets better. The Lord forgot to light the inside of them, and he forgot to make a way for the people inside of them to breathe. This led Mahanrai Mori Ankumar to go before the Lord and say, Oh Lord, there's no light in them, in them we cannot breathe. Yes! And so the Lord touches rocks that glow. Remember, Joseph's looking in a hat. The Lord touches rocks that glow, and then he tells them, he changes the code on how to build a skin barge, and he says, put a hole in the top. And then he also says, and I'll allow you to put a hole in the bottom. So these footballs have a hole in the top. They have a hole in the bottom. They're cruising through the Pacific Ocean with people and animals inside. Mahan Rai Mori Ankimer, <laughs> tall as a tree. Let's open up the phone lines. 801-973-TV20, 801-973-8820. Turn down your television sets, please. LDS callers preferred. First time callers, if at all possible. All right, we have a summer special going on right now. Five Aletheia products valued at over 100 bucks for 50. Now we've added an extra exciting incentive to this product thing. You can get all those five products. Uh, you can get the three books. You can get a DVD. You can get the CD. You go to www.hotm.tv. Order those. You get all five. And if you order any product like that, we will also give you the new and improved Joseph's Myth Bumper Sticker. Um, now, I realize some of you aren't going to put these on your cars for obvious reasons, but maybe you can think of another reason why to where to put your uh, things. I mean, I don't know. There's something you could do with them, you know? And they would, I tell you, I put it on my laptop and I went to a, a Paradise Cafe today, and I am telling you, if looks could kill, I would have cancer right now. People were so ticked off at that thing. So find somewhere to put the uh, bumper sticker, and uh, you get one free if you order the book, or books, or products. All right, we have Jason uh, in, uh, no, we have Jim in Orem. Jim, you're on Heart of the Matter. Jim? Yes, hi, who is this? This is Sean. Oh, maybe I'm watching the wrong program with you, because you're speaking while... You're speaking here. <laughs> oh. It's because there's a delay, uh, Jim. There's oh, a delay. that's interesting. Very good. You have to turn your TV down. Oh, okay. Well, let's whispering. Let me just turn completely off. We'll wait. Uh, well, let's read the program. That's fine. Did a podcast. Okay, I'm, I'm just curious. What's, what's the motivation for all this? I mean, is there anything else that you want to do in your life? I, I don't know. Oh, there's a lot of things I'd like to do with my life. Uh, it just seems kind of curious. I, I, I really didn't, did not know the extent of how bad you feel about certain things like this. I, I, I actually, I'm kind of sad. How come? Is, is there any chance that I might be invited on your show? Well, Jim, what makes you sad, first of all? Does the truth make you sad? Well, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna disagree with anything you said. I, I'm sure there's there's hundreds of thousands. This is where we have lots of errors in the Book of Mormon, and there are several errors. It, it's a sad thing, but I, I the, the attention on that. It's just I just feel sad for that. Well, Jim, the reason the, the, I could the, be invited on your show. Well, Jim, I mean, first I don't know who you are. Well, and I, a, I don't. I mean, I don't know. You could be wearing a tinfoil well, hat I, right I, now. I, Jim, let me continue to talk just for a second, okay? Are you there? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, you have to email me and tell me who you are and why you're going to be on the show. We like official representatives, Jim, and let me tell you why. 
because they, ha they have to speak the truth. Uh, I had a conversation with my mom today, and she told me, well, I don't believe that. She's LDS. I said, well, mom, it doesn't matter what you believe. It matters what the church teaches, you see? And so if you come on the show, you can come up here and you can say almost anything, Jim. But, and so it's going to be a very frustrating situation for the audience and for me, and we won't know what's true. But if I get an official representative to come on, which they won't do, but if I get one of them on and I can ask them, tell me, how does a person get to the celestial kingdom? What's necessary? And I can ask them questions. They have to answer honestly because they know I'm going to pull them on that. You don't. Do you see? Um, I think I would do all right in that area. I'm not an official of the church, but I, I'm an active member. All right, I, let's I, practice I, right now, okay? Let me ask you a question, okay? I go ahead. All right, Jim, you're LDS? Yes. Are you a Christian? Uh, well, I've heard two definitions of that word. In fact, somebody stopped me the other day, and I was upset that they told me that I wasn't a Christian. Uh, so I'm asking you. Let's, let's, back, let's back up tell me what definition you're going by. Well, you define it. You tell me if you're a Christian, and I'll let you define it. Well, I've heard two definitions. Any, uh, you know, if a person would like to follow Christ and keep the commandments, that would be fine with me. And okay, really what commandments, Jim? I'm not, I'm not disturbed what church they go to pay. Okay, and Jim. They talk about Jesus Christ, the Savior. Talk about him. Okay. I would be a perfect piece in their house at the dinner table. Well, very good, Jim. Let me ask so, you, what commandments would they need to follow that you're talking about? Well, hopefully the Ten Commandments and uh, whatever extensions of them might give the, might be in, they be, might be inspired to do. Okay, Ten Commandments or whatever extension. Things like they your, might be your love and loveliness and kindness and um, going the extra mile. Okay, um, that makes it. That's the that's yeah. the definition of Mormon Christianity. People could feel impressions to do certain things, you know, if they feel moved upon, you know, they, that, you know. Okay, I agree with that. I, I could see that. I agree with that. Jim, yeah. uh, pe people could be moved upon individually to do certain things, but what about a religion that, that moves upon people that says they must do certain things? Must do. Yeah, now, for instance, Jim, so we can cut to the chase. Oh, Jim, that's fine. If you're, um, if you're LDS... I'm sure there's other commandments to do. That if no, they, no, 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 no. Let, let's just stay on this, Jim. That's fine. Jim, you're LDS. I asked if you were Christian. You said obey the commandments. I asked which ones. You laid out a few things. Is going to the temple a commandment of Jesus? According to the teachings of the church, we are commanded to go to the temple. That's okay, correct. and what do you have to do there, and what's it necessary for, Jim? Well, that's a rather long dissertation. What no, it can, you can, I can summarize it in 10 seconds. Now, you want to be on the show, summarize it in 10 seconds. Why do you go to the temple as a Mormon, as a Christian Mormon? Tell, tell the audience who are Christians and want to know, are you really a Christian? Oh, I see your meaning. Okay, uh, that, that is a rather delicate subject, because I don't know that 10 seconds would do it proper justice and dignity. All right, so let's let that one go. Sure. Do you, do you, do I would certainly like to write, uh, I could write a little dissertation. But I'm you want to write a dissertation to be a guest on the show. Now, Jim, do you, do you have to be baptized? You have to be baptized. Well, Jesus yes or no? Did mention that. Yes or no? Well, Jesus Christ mentioned it, one needs to be baptized. Okay, so that's a yes. Do you have to be baptized by a Mormon in order to live in the celestial kingdom with God after this life? According to the teachings of the church, that's correct. Okay, so then are Mormons the only one who will be in heaven after this life? That's not true. Okay, now wait a second. You said you have to be baptized to enter into the celestial kingdom, to be with God after this life, and it's got to be by somebody holding the Mormon priesthood but you said other people can be in heaven and not accept the Mormon teachings. Is that true? Okay, well, first you said celestial kingdom. I'm talking celestial kingdom. Oh, forgive me. According to the teachings of the church, the highest level, yes, you have to be baptized by one who has permission from above to do it. Okay, do you have to do anything else besides being baptized by a Mormon holding the Mormon priesthood to enter the highest level, which is where God lives? God doesn't live in the second or third levels. He only lives in the highest. So let's only talk about the highest. Can another person get into the highest and live with God if they aren't 
baptized, if they aren't a member, if they don't go through the temple, if they don't wear the garments, if they refuse to pay tithing, if they don't obey the Sabbath day, can, can those people who say, I'm not going to ever be a Mormon, but I just believe in Jesus, and I'll never be baptized by a Mormon and their priesthood, can they go to that highest heaven where God dwells? Yes or no? They cannot, according to the teaching. Thank you. I appreciate your honesty. And I'm toning it down now because you are being honest. So I appreciate that. So tell me, are you saying that Mormonism is the only way to live with God after this life? Let me think about responding because there's a missing piece of doctrine here. On the three levels, uh, people do, people, I understand that people will get visited from the ones above it to the second and third level, so it's not like you're going to miss it out completely. So Jesus gets to but, visit. Uh, in the presence of Heavenly Father and the Savior, that belongs to the highest level. But I understand, in other cases, I can't think of them where, where I read okay. it right now. But, All right, Jim, uh, that's okay. You've done a really good job, and you've been honest, and I appreciate it. So, Jim, and, let me say this. To our Christian audience. Visit it to the second or the third level, but I can't Second and third level, man. We've said enough here. Let me say I this. I don't remember the particulars. It's that. okay. Jim, yes, to sir. the Christian who is watching, who knows the Bible, this is what they say. You're a Christian when you believe that Jesus Christ came and did everything for you. Right. No, no, I'm talking everything, Jim. Everything. No temple, no baptism, no priesthood confirmation, no laying on of hands, no tithing, no Sabbath day. Christians and their manual, the Bible says, he did everything. And we look on him and we say, my God, thank you for saving a wretch like me. I believe you did it. Save me, Lord. That is a Christian, Jim. You just described you something completely different than what the manual describes. Okay, so go ahead. No, we're fine. I completely agree with everything that you said. He did it all. If he did it all, then why do you have to enter the temple, wear garments every day of your life thereafter, sustain your local leaders, including a man who calls himself a prophet? Why do you have to do those things? And we have, Jim, you know we have the quotes that will show that it says you must do these things to live with Heavenly Father after this life. So we have a disconnect here. Do you see it? It sounds like... Uh First, we're discussing the atonement, which will cover a lot of, so the doors of heaven could be open. But then, that's what Jesus part Jesus did on his side. Okay, that's his and part. On my side, my responsibility on my side, if he has, if the Savior has more things to say, I certainly don't want to put a sock in his mouth. And just if he has more things to say to expect of us, that's perfectly fine, too. Okay, so... Uh, that I, word atonement. I, now you realize, Jim, that that's a made up word by Tyndale. He made that word up, at one meant, because there was no real good English word for propitiation, which the Greek and Hebrew gave us. So at one meant was a created word. Funny, it made its way into the Book of Mormon, but nevertheless, it was a created word by Tyndale. And what I know Mormons believe in atonement. What you're saying is you believe Jesus suffered for the sins of this world. And that it's because he suffered, it gives you an opportunity to return and live with Heavenly Father. Is that correct? Uh, I'm sure you think the same thing. That's correct. We don't think the same thing. And let me tell you why. Because in addition to atonement and propitiation, the Bible, Romans teaches that we are also imputed with Christ's righteousness. You see, Mormonism does not believe that you are imputed with his righteousness. You are about to establish your own righteousness by virtue of your own good works and your own good living. That is a major chasm between what Christians believe and what Mormons believe. Oh, there's a missing detail there. What's that? Um, I take everything you say and add the rest. They both belong together. If we're categorically, let's see, your good works, what, what I can't do of myself, Jesus Christ will certainly make up the difference. Uh, the atonement takes effect, you know, for spiritual and physical redemption. And, you know, and in the meantime, if the, the Lord would ask me to do things, to be a member of his group, then that's perfectly fine with me. And, I realize it's perfectly fine with you, but it's not biblical. In fact, it's opposite, uh, of, what, it's opposite of what the, the Bible teaches, Jim. The apostles were Jim. asked to do certain 
But Jim, okay. men have asked okay. you to do those certain things. No, 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 no. Jim, men have asked you to do those certain things using the Lord's name. The Bible does not do that. Do you see the difference? Okay, you said that real fast. I didn't men catch. have you you're saying and if the Lord asks us to do other things, it's okay. The people who have asked you to do those other things were men, Joseph Smith particularly. You see? And so Joseph Actually, Smith... Actually, I'm thinking of Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John said nothing about temples, nothing about Masonic rites, nothing about wearing Fine. garments, nothing about uh, baptism necessary for salvation, nothing about priesthood. Well, read about Hebrews that, but... No, read Hebrews Fine. 6, 7, and 8. Read Hebrews, nothing about priesthood. So, and we could go on and on and on. And that's my point. You talk a really nice talk. It sounds like you're Christian. But Jim, I was Mormon 40 years. And I've been a Christian for now, I don't know how many, 15. And I got to tell you, Jim, what you say sounds good and sort of appealing, but it's not true. You are in bondage and you are under a complete yoke. Jesus said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. The Mormon yoke is heavy. You've got to do your home teaching. You've got to get to that temple. You've got to pay your tithing. It's fire insurance for his second coming. And you can't go to the temple unless you pay it. You got to keep the Sabbath day holy. You've got to get married in the temple in the new and everlasting covenant to live with God again. You, and, and we're just beginning to scratch the surface, Jim. So when you tell the story and you sound so nice, and I like you because you've been honest, but it's not Christianity, my brother. This call's gone on long enough. I'm not hanging up on you. You email me and we'll talk about you being on the show. Okay? Well, you quoted certain, lots of certain additional commandments. If the heavens want to do that, they'll certainly respond to what the heavens suggest. It's not, a, it's, not, it's not arbitrarily uh, presented uh, in Mormonism. It is I, mandatorily book, presented, Jim. Uh, you're talking while I'm speaking now. I don't think it necessarily has to be locked inside a Bible. I don't see why you can't go anyplace else. Why you can't what? Oh, I don't see why you can't go anyplace else. To okay, well, then we've opened up a whole new avenue. Well, go back two weeks and watch Jim James Johnson get interviewed. He's opened up a whole new avenue. He says God is a woman who's blue, and her name is Kaka, or KK, no. or something like that. I forget what, I swear, I'm not making this up. No. He's gone outside the Bible and said, here's some new things for you, Jim. This, we, the call's gone on long enough. Email me, and we'll talk about you being on the show. Thank you for being honest, okay? Bye-bye. Okay. All right, uh, we're going to go to Bob. Called a few years ago. Bob, you're on Heart of the Matter. Hello, yes. I just, I just had a question. Yeah. Actually, I wanted you to give an explanation. Last week, you said, um, if um, he said our sins don't send us to hell, it was something else. That no, sins, sins, do, the, the the sins that you're thinking of, no, do not send you to hell, Jim, or whatever your name is. <laughs> what? So, can you explain that? Yeah, Bob. I'm sorry. <clears throat> um. Scripture, and I don't have them in front of me, but we have at least three, says that Jesus came and he suffered for the sins of the whole world, especially them that believe. Jesus suffered for all the sins of the world, and the word in the, is propitiated. He, he got, gave, got forgiveness for the sins of this world by virtue of his suffering on the cross. And so what happens is people live on this world and they walk about and the Holy Spirit is calling to everybody. The Father is trying to draw all to him. And some refuse to hear. They have eyes and ears, but they can't hear or see. And some say I, uh, they hear. And, and those who hear say, I believe that Jesus took care of my sin on the cross and I've been forgiven. And they go to heaven for their faith. It's for their faith upon him. It is not for the sins they committed or even will commit after believing on him because we will continue to make some sins. Now, those who die without hearing, seeing, believing in their heart, and they go and they say, I reject that. I want to live for this world. I want to do my own thing. I'm not going to listen to the callings and promptings of the Holy Spirit. I'm moving forward. And they die without that covering. They die guilty of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit for which there is no forgiveness of sin. You see, they had the call and they knew throughout their life Jesus was calling them. They discounted it. Romans 1, 2 proves that to us. And so it's not for their sin. It is for their sin, but it's the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Ghost because all sin has been taken care of by Christ on the cross. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, uh, yeah, it does. It does. Uh, that, that's what I meant, my friend. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, Bob. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. We're going to Jason on line two in Ohio. Jason, you're on Heart of the Matter. Hi, Sean. Jason. Are you there right now, Sean? I am. This is Diane. Yes. Okay. Listen, huh? I just love you so much. I want to talk to you. I went to the doctors yesterday again about this uh, MS, multiple sclerosis problem, and this has been the fifth time they've told me that it looks like that's what I have. Uh -huh. But I've got to have a spinal tap, and I just, I am so frightened, and I believe in Jesus. But I'm kind of confused. You know, I've been a reborn Christian, and uh, I'm not Mormon anymore. I was reborn in 1982, and I believe in you so much, and I believe in Jesus, the main person I should believe in. He's the only person. That's right. That's right. Our Jesus. So you're afraid and you're fearful because of the testing that's coming up for your multiple sclerosis? Yes, and not only that, but I feel like I'm talking underwater. I'm having very bad symptoms. I can't do my normal activities. I'm very, very ill, and I don't know what to do. Well, Diane, first and foremost, do you go to a local church? I can't get out and go. I'm trying to find transportation, and it looks like I'm going to have that pretty soon. I called in about a month ago, and um, these uh, wonderful people that listen to your show are going to help me out to get Di to church. Diane, don't hang up after we uh, end the call. Just stay on, and we'll get your address, and we'll get somebody out there to see you and pray with you. But here's the thing I want you to understand. One, I can't comprehend your physical suffering. I, I see people who have physical suffering, it blows my mind. I am such a wimp. If I get a headache, I am, I'm just a big baby. And you guys go through so much. Uh, so it's easy for me to say this, but I do want you to know that there is no fear in him. He will see you through. And we live by faith, Diane, and that pleases the Father. It's the only thing that pleases Him, is our faith, according to Hebrews. So, my sister, we will add you to the prayer list. Uh, viewers out there, pray for Diane and her multiple sclerosis, the testing she's going to go through. And uh, leave us your name. But I want you to know He is there. I don't understand uh, the suffering. And, but He is there, and uh, He will bring you comfort. So continue, my sister. Trust in Him. Stay in the Word and go forth, okay? Thank you. I love you and everybody out there. Thank you. Love you too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Pray for Diane. Horrible diseases of this world. And, you know, i got to make the point. To the Mormons, and, I, I, I'm, you know, I love, I love you. And I do this with my life because you're deluded. And my family's deluded. And I hate to see them in bondage. But to the Mormons, Adam's fall was a good thing. It was a fall upward, and it gave everybody a chance to progress according to them, and that means to suffer. And Diane's suffering was part of God's plan, you see, and children being raped, and the wars, and the blown off arms and legs, and the crime, and rapes, and murders, those were all part of God's plan. He was glad that Adam disobeyed him, and sin was brought into this world. That very fact, when I started studying, said, I don't believe in that God. I believe in a God who loves and created a garden and said, obey me, I want to have fellowship with you and we'll keep it great. But men introduced it, but the Mormons say, no, this was a fall was good and it's a lie. And because of it, we have these disasters like this. Let's go to Marty uh, on line one in Wyoming. Marty, you're on Heart of the Matter. Hey, brother, how are you? Good, how you doing? I'm doing good. Hey, I just got a quick question for you and I'll get off. I know you guys are busy um, and also... Before I forget, if you're coming through Wyoming on your tour this summer, uh, your operator's got my phone number. Um, call me. I'd love to buy you dinner. But um, I'm going to be a big uh, bill, baby. <laughs> hey, I'm a, I'm a Christian pastor, and, and uh, we get the opportunity to witness to um, LDS quite often. As a matter of fact, we invite them into missionaries into our home and feed them, and, and just take the opportunity to to love on them and, and witness to them. And and uh, uh, one of the questions that we ask is uh, about how the plates were translated. Uh, obviously, that's uh, there's some issues there, but um, 
my question is, if the plates were translated the way the witnesses say they were, um, every word and every letter was given, um, and if it wasn't written down correctly, uh, you know, it, was, it stayed until it was uh, corrected. If that's the case, why um, was it changed from 1830 to 1837? Pretty typical question. But what I've seen is lately we're seeing missionaries that are saying things like, well, we don't consider those witnesses to be reliable um, anymore because of things that happened uh, after the fact or they left the church or whatever. So if it's not written in our books, we don't consider that scripture. And because we don't consider it reliable, we don't even want to talk about Martin Harris and Oliver Cowdery um, and those people anymore. So um, my question is, uh, how, how, do you, how do you deal with that? How would you deal with that? And uh, I'll hang up and let you answer that question. Thanks, uh, Pastor. God bless you. You know, uh, Mormonism is, uh, they have at their uh, ready the opportunity to play any side of the fence. And they can play, we go with the witnesses, we don't go with the witnesses. Anything that's convenient to get their message across. And they will play it, and that's what the missionaries are taught to do. So now in the MTC, they're telling them to be this way, and they're doing it. As far as the specific reason, uh, reason with the witnesses, they're probably doing it this way because online we can find out what happened with the witnesses and how faulty the stories were, and so they're going on to another pasture. It's just all about morphing truth and keeping alive and keeping people deluded. Really quickly, uh, a young man wrote in, my mother says that even if the LDS church isn't true, she'd never leave it. They teach morality, love, and compassion. How can a just God hold that against her? Uh, you know, it's all perspective in this life, my friends. Uh, as humans, we are naturally pretty egocentric. And we think by virtue of us just being here with our, our nappy little heads, boy, God's going to love us. He just loves us. We're so cute. How could he ever get angry with us? And I'm going to tell you something. He, uh, he is a holy God. And he does not mess around. He loved the world so much, he sent his only begotten son to take care of all that sin. And if it was compassion, and if it was a morality, and if it was love uh, in the way that humans can express it that would save us, Jesus would never have to have come. We could have just been a compassionate, loving people and got on with it. But that doesn't work. Our compassion, our love, our stuff is junk. We have nothing. That's why he himself had to come in his holiness, suffer and pay for our sins, and impute us with his righteousness for us to be holy before the Father when we die. It's always and only about him and him alone. If you don't know that, you are making a huge mistake with your time here on this earth. Get back, get on your knees, ask the Lord to open your eyes. He'll do it. He did it with me. He's doing it more and more. We'll see you next week here on Heart of the Matter.